Dodgers TV. Western Newfoundland and welcome back to another great season of West Talk here on Rogers TV. We're so happy to be able to come at you every week with the latest information from right here in Western Newfoundland. Um, as most of you will know uh, from our interviews we did in the fall, I've joined the team at Marble Mountain and to give you guys an update on how things have been going so far, uh, it's been great and things are very exciting. The atmosphere has been so fun and if you find yourself having to endure winter in western Newfoundland, Marble Mountain is a place that can really help you out with that. Um, so we're all very lucky that we've received lots of great support from all of you and from our government as well. Speaking of that, today we have a very special guest with us. Uh, someone you'll all know well and a little bit better after these next few moments. Um, an orthopedic surgeon, an author, philanthropist, leader of the Liberal Party and the Premier of Newfoundland and Labrador, Mr. Andrew Fury. Hi, how are you? Great, Premier. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, happy to be here. Yeah, what brings you out to the West Coast? Uh, we're having a cabinet retreat here, here this week, but I'm also going to do some uh, skiing with my family this weekend. Oh, is that right? Yeah, yeah, I can't wait. Yeah? How long have you been skiing for? I started skiing in high school, but I spent a full winter here in Cornerbrook um, during my surgical training. And oh. uh, Dr. Kurzan, who many of your uh, yep. uh, viewers will remember, <laughs> yes. Dr. Lewis, uh, would often let me go up to the hill as part of my training. So I yeah. skied for about, I'd say that's when I uh, really uh, got quite passionate about it and have been uh, an avid, avid skier ever since. Right. That's not how you've spurred your interest in orthopedic surgery. Right <laughs> no, no, definitely not. I mean, <laughs> I've been a touch wood. Uh, hopefully no one gets injured, uh, yeah. it, but it, it's, a, it's an incredible activity. You're outdoors. You can do it with families. Yeah. We've really noticed as our kids have been in, in the activity, um, you know, you get to, what other time do you get to spend 20 minutes uninterrupted with your child with no device yeah. uh, other than on a chairlift? Yeah. It's, and then to, to watch my kids grow and be able to be now on the back of my skis uh, is quite fun and entertaining. And yeah. uh, it's a great thing. And my wife grew up skiing. She's from the West Coast. Uh, oh, she's uh, um, yeah, she's from Portland, Oregon. So she uh, grew up in skiing, you know, oh. big, big terrain. Yeah. And uh, so we're, we're quite a skiing family. I just love it. It's yeah. our annual vacation. Okay, yeah. awesome. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I've got to say, uh, I've got a little two-year-old rascal at home myself yeah. now. And being up around the hill this winter and seeing all these young kids getting into it and just, you know, father, mother, son, daughter. It's excellent. Uh, yeah, all being together and uh, enjoying the sport together is just absolutely incredible. Hey, you're outdoors, it's good yeah. activity, it's good family time, it's good friend time, and the apres ski is always a bit of fun too. The apres is great. Yeah. And I, I just can't think of a better way for us to now, it's just the timing seems so right for Marvel right now, to, to be open and to be so vibrant as we're all sort of ready to... There's a lot of pent up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I don't know what it is yeah. that we'll say is pent up, but you know, there's something there and people seem ready to sort of reconnect. Absolutely, and you know, we we were lucky enough to we visited you on the hill here on Thursday, and um, it's a great vibe yeah. going there now. Uh, you know, it's a great asset. It's uh, like I said, I grew up on the hill, like you know, yeah. as a skier, um, and it's just a fantastic uh, asset. That uh, it's yeah. nice to see uh, new blood uh, re-energize the vibe, and yeah. uh, and just some minor renos. Uh, you know, changing yeah. the daycare space around, all that stuff is excellent, and that yeah. uh, you know, it's it's a it's fun. I feel like I'm home when I'm in the base of Marble Mountain. That's awesome. Yeah. You know, and we've, uh, I sort of, I haven't had the opportunity to travel to a lot of the big resorts around yet. Um, you know, but people are often reminding me that Marble Mountain has some of the most unique and diverse terrain and, and partially why we breed so many great skiers and snowboarders from this hill. 100%. I, I've been fortunate in my life too to ski uh, in Europe, to ski out west, to ski in the U.S. Well. Um, and Marble Mountain, when it has snow, is there is no other hill like it. I mean, you may have more terrain in Whistler or something, but you can't forget you can't ski all that, right? So hey, you can only <laughs> you can only ski like one or two lifts at a time. Yeah. And Marble just has an incredible vertical. It has great terrain. It has. Uh, 
you know, if you're aggressive, you can, boomerang's a great run, uh, Musgrave's oh, yeah. a great run. Are you a boomeranger yourself? I am a boomeranger, yeah. Nice. Yeah, yeah that's, that's my train right there. Oh, I mean, yeah. I'm getting older now, and I'm not sure how, mo how, how much longer my knees are going to hold up. <laughs> Uh, but uh, it's it, it's it's a sport that you can do forever too. I mean, being out here with Dr. Cruzan, yeah. for example, he skiing the quarter ride stuff. Uh, is was a beautiful yeah. skier and uh, continues to be. And so, uh, we're my, myself and my wife are looking at doing this uh, well into. Yeah, I mean, in the I'll 80s or 90s. Yeah. Like we, have a, we have a race coming up at Marble on uh, February the 25th, the Old Sam race, which oh, certainly yeah, yeah. you've been yeah. familiar with because yeah. it's been happening for 58 years. Yeah. Um, and every year there's people entering that race who are in their 80s That's and competing in a downhill ski it's race. Excellent. Right? So, yeah. excellent. Yeah, excellent. Yeah. It's yeah. absolutely incredible. Yeah. Um, Premier, there's lots of things I would love to be able to ask you about today. I've been hoping to speak to you for a long time, but of course we only get 10 minutes here. Sure. Um, That's why I'm just trying to talk about skiing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'd be happy to. <laughs> Um, I'm, kidding, I'm wondering if you could give us uh, any, you know, information. There's been an additional release in the media this week about another flight um, or an airline company that's going to be coming into Deer yeah. Lake. That now makes they're two gonna swoop in. options. Yeah, they're going to swoop in here. Yeah. Um, what can you tell us about sort of what's what's evolving in Deer Lake through the airport and what that could mean to all of us here in Western Newfoundland? Yeah, no, so, I mean, the airport in Deer Lake is an incredible asset. It's a gateway to uh, for people for work, uh, but also for come from ways for fun. And um, we've recognized that as a government how important uh, that airport is. But equally, the airlines understand uh, what an asset that is in terms of, uh, look, they're not doing anything for free. Mm -hmm. uh, so make yeah. no mistake, they, they think yeah. that this is a profitable area to be in. Yeah. We've always understood that, but it's nice to see now that other, um, other industry players are understanding that. Yeah. We have an incredible tourism product here, best in the world, and we know that Canadians especially want to come and see it. Yeah. They're, in, they're infatuated and, and mesmerized and sometimes confused by Newfoundland and Labrador. <laughs> and, uh, having more routes available to people to come to uh, to our province and to our beautiful scenery and our generous, beautiful people uh, really uh, puts the tourism sector on a, on a better uh, footing than they have been certainly for the last couple of years. Yeah. But as a government, we equally realize that you know, emerging from the pandemic is a time to really reevaluate where we want to go with the product. And one thing that we've heard over and over again is routes, security of routes. Yeah. You know, it, people need, it, you know, in this day and age where you can pick up your phone and have something delivered uh, to your yeah. door within a couple of days, it's a bit of an inconvenience to do two or three flight changes. So, you know, Minister Crocker has been working with the industry to uh, look at uh, a, a route plan, uh, yeah. a route plan to ensure that you know, we're really delivering um, the accessibility that we need because we know we have the end product. We just need the accessibility piece. Yeah. And so the announcement you saw the other day and now with Swoop coming on board as well is, uh, is, 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 is all good stuff. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, you know, I noticed that these connections aren't necessarily right into Pearson Airport. They're to some of the surrounding airports, which was to me seemed to be maybe how the cost can be kept Absolutely, in, a, in yeah. a really good place. And uh, I think they're looking at Southwest and other kind of, you know, yeah. no, thrill, no frills airlines, you know, from, yeah. uh, from the U.S. and trying to replicate that uh, in Canada. Yeah. Yeah, it makes I mean, sense. that's always been a big part of the puzzle for travelers is, is getting here yeah. and, you know, the expense to get here. So really happy to see. And uh, in, a, in, a, in a sort of side world, I'm involved with real estate as well. And I've noticed this year this tremendous uptick in interest in Western Newfoundland from people all over Canada. Um, you know, there's a lot of homes being sold on FaceTime to people who, yep. who, you know, who are seeing the value mostly, right? 100%. I mean, Minister Byrne, who, you know, local MHA, has yeah. done a great job in respect to the immigration uh, uh, portfolio that yeah. we've, and population growth, which we put a huge emphasis on. I mean, I think everyone knows. I, I don't think people really appreciated it a decade ago, but yeah. it, it is an acute crisis right now as, as our communities are aging. Yeah. Um, however, Minister Byrne and I sat down uh, during the pandemic and looked at this uh, you know, interprovincial migration, if you will, uh, people coming from, people don't want to live in downtown Toronto in the middle of a pandemic with two youngsters, uh, yeah. hove off, locked down. Especially 40 when you're re working remotely from home? Working remotely from home anyway, uh, 40 degree temperatures in the middle of the summer, minus 40 in the winter people yeah. it represents an opportunity and I think you're seeing some of the fruits of, of, of us capitalizing on that with increasing population numbers yeah. for the first time in a long time in, in yeah. Newfoundland and Labrador yeah so 
do you think that Newfoundland is in for a little bit of a boom in these next few years? Well, I, I mean, I, you know, I live, I'm an eternal optimist, and yeah. uh, I think we do. I think we are. And, um, I th and here's why. Uh, we will continue to tackle the day-to-day -day problems like any government does. Mm -hmm. uh, but we have put incredible emphasis on tackling the big problems as well. So you have to be in the weeds, but you also have to have a vision. And when you're recreating a population for a modernized Newfoundland and Labrador, that touches everything else. Mm -hmm. But we are really well positioned in Newfoundland and Labrador during this time of transition. Look, every other province, every other jurisdiction, every other country is facing this time of energy transition. Mm -hmm. We are lucky in Newfoundland and Labrador to have an abundance on both sides. So if you look at Alberta, the fulcrum of that scale is set very closely to non-renewables. Yeah. We are very balanced. We, we have an incredible abundance of renewable resources that we haven't even touched the surface of. Right. I mean, one of the things that Newfoundlanders and Labradorians have always complained about is the wind. Yeah. We have an incredible resource in our wind that we haven't even begun to develop. So. And the wind is important because we have, you know, it's, it's not only an incredible resource, with the, our geographic proximity to Europe, our geographic proximity to the northeastern seaboard. Mm. And some of the economics of wind projects have acutely changed in the last two years if, as there's all this displaced capital, yeah. capital from the non-renewable sector. Mm -hmm. That said, we're not turning our back on the, the non-renewables either because right. we really think that we have, we don't think, we know we have, some of the lowest carbon emitting oil in the world. Yeah. We're not naive. We know that this is a time of transition, but we equally know that we have some of the lowest carbon emitting projects in the world off our coast, driving a higher commodity price, by the way. So when you look at projects like Beta Nord, those are the projects that, frankly, Canada should be looking at to lead the rest of the world. It can be a very low carbon emitting footprint, yeah. um, and because it's new, we, we get to develop, uh, Equinor gets to develop all kinds of new technologies to further lower that carbon mm -hmm. footprint. It's naive to think that we won't be living with oil for the next 10, 20 years or so. I mean, I think that that's quite clear, especially when yeah. you have markets like China, Russia, and India just saying, well, we're not ready to move yet, or, yeah. you know, it'll be a bit slower. Yeah. So I, I would argue that as a nation, we have a moral and ethical imperative to continue to develop projects like Beta Nord so that we're shutting down the lower carbon emitting uh, uh, at projects. Yeah. If you look at the oil sands, they're 60 to 80 kilograms per barrel. Beta Nord would be eight or less. I mean, that is world leading, and that is something that if we truly recognize we're in a time of transition, we need to capitalize on that product while it's valuable. Wow. That's very well said, and that gives me a lot of confidence, uh, you know, as a young Newfoundlander and now father who's going to presumably spend the rest of my life as long as I can here in the, in the <laughs> I'm going to hold you to it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, we've just got a moment left, and so I'd love to take this opportunity to ask you for some personal advice. Sure. Um, what advice would you have uh, now? You know, you've been, uh, you know, you've worked as an orthopedic surgeon, which I imagine to be a, quite a hectic uh, job at times, and now the premier of this province. Um, what advice would you have for a young Newfoundlander, you know, or entrepreneurs or people who find themselves sometimes trying to balance family and, you know, an ambitious career goal? Um, what would you say to that person? Yeah, um, my single piece of advice to anyone out there um, is don't be afraid to fail. Uh, don't be too hard on yourself if you do fail. Any, any path to success is filled with bumps of failure. No one gets up one morning and is the best orthopedic surgeon in the world or a good premier or anything else. It comes with time. Learning is an evolution, and you have to give yourself the permission internally, emotionally, to fail. Every, you know, the error would be if you don't learn from those failures, obviously, and you can continue to, uh, to yeah. subject yourself to continuous failures. That's yeah. Einstein's definition of insanity, of course. But Indeed. you need to give yourself, out outwardly and internally, the permission to try things. And if they don't work, then you chalk it off to experience, and then you'll come back better for it. Hmm. Well, well, I really appreciate that advice, Premier. And thank you again for being here with us today. Now it's a pleasure. Thank you. Awesome. And folks at home, we're going to take a quick break, cut to commercial, and we'll be back. Stay tuned. And we're back. Uh, of course, coming out of this pandemic together, uh, there's lots to think about. And certainly lots of different groups have been affected in different ways. One conversation that has come up a lot over the last few years centers around children and in particular their education and what it means for them to not be able to learn in actual schools. Uh, this is also the case for many adults in our country and in our province who 
struggle with literacy and are trying to educate themselves to develop their skills to be more competitive in the workplace and in today's world and without you know the learning with their learning mechanisms turned upside down this has been a challenge adding to that the fact that digital literacy is low in certain uh, of these groups and when you're forced to have to learn online that can just be a whole confusing situation and so here to talk about that in particular with us today an expert on the topic from ABC Life Literacy Canada Gwim Philip Gwim thanks for joining us today oh hi Dustin very happy to be here and um, happy to share a few things that ABC Life Literacy has to offer for the residents of Newfoundland and Labrador and the entire Canada for that matter. Awesome. So why don't you tell us just real quick about ABC Literacy Canada and uh, what that means to people in this province. Yeah. So, so uh, ABC Life Literacy Canada supports organizations uh, oh, to empower them and to have all adults live a fully engaged life and we do that through learning materials um, for in particular for Newfoundland and Labrador we have the Activate Learning Program and our literacy resources for the Activate Learning Program were designed in specific for the residents of Newfoundland and Labrador in mind uh, for the adult learner and their families to help empower them and uh, help them advance in the skills that they need to live fully engaged lives at home, in their communities, and also uh, at work. Uh, so we have a wide array of uh, learning modules, literacy skills, um, well beyond reading, writing, and numeracy. Uh, we have employability skills such as collaboration and time management, uh, stress management, confidence, as well as financial literacy skills um, that learners can develop through smart shopping, just to give you an example, and also health literacy skills to help adults um, take charge of their health. So all of these learning modules um, that were originally delivered through workbooks and workshops were now moved to an online learning platform. And that is what really I would like to talk about more, uh, the ABC Skills Hub. Excellent. And uh, before we just jump into that, can you speak to, you know, I, I've seen here that you've provided a us with information that says 48% uh, of adult Canadians have a literacy level that's less than, we'll say, the high school average right now. And so do we know where that is now in terms of digital literacy and, and how adults are feeling, how confident they're feeling in their ability to engage online and digitally, but also to learn digitally? I just feel like um, for people who are trying to develop literacy skills, adding the digital platform as a learning tool might might compound the issue a little bit. Can you speak to that at all? Yes, and and, and so so true. There's actually now the digital divide that that has been the new uh, piece uh, that that came in, you know, with everything we we, we had enough challenges to deal with. But the ABC Skills Hub actually addresses that uh, exactly that exactly low literacy adults or or anyone but particularly adults can log into this platform and it is not any more difficult to navigate the courses uh, these one hour to 90 minute courses that we have on the skills hub no more difficult really than than, than to do anything that people do on their phones nowadays. So all you need is to really create a user profile with your email address and the password, and on you go. It is so simple. Uh, all the pages are very straightforward. None, none of these overcrowded pages with lots of options. You move on with clearly marked buttons and the whole experience is just very, very friendly. So it was created with low literacy adult learners in mind. 
Interesting, yeah. It's uh, like you said, I, I just was, as I was traveling down for this, I thought, okay, if someone is, we'll say, illiterate or can't read and write, and, you know, so how much of a challenge does it then to become to, you know, create an email address and create an account and a profile and to be able to log in using URLs to these things, you know, are they barriers to entry? So great to hear that uh, these tools have, you know, are, are simplified and, and user friendly. I know for people with high literacy, it, some of these tools can still be confusing in itself. So this is very interesting. And so how do, how do we collect this information about literacy rates in Canada? Like, how do we know that 58% of adult Canadians fall below this, this certain mark? Um, well, we don't do that, <laughs> but, but, but certainly there are organizations and who, governmental organizations, so the statistics of which we rely on. Um, the kind of statistics that we gather uh, through our learners is how our learners feel before they take any of the courses that we offer and afterwards. So how it is exactly collected nationwide is, uh, is beyond us. Sure. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Can't, uh, can't do it all. <laughs> yeah. So I, I guess the question was, you know, where, where the data comes from, I suppose, and what organizations you lean on to, to get these statistics about where we are. And you know what? I don't have that handy right here in front of me. Uh, okay. But yes, they're all legitimate data, yes. Awesome, awesome. Um, and can you speak to how literacy skills are, you know, directly relating to peop to adults' employment opportunities now? Well, of course, um, with employment opportunities um, really not being that great, to, to say the least, of course, um, adults' confidence levels are sinking, and, and that's not a good place uh, to, to start looking for a, for a job or, or to start a job. And so with the employability skills that we provide, we aim to, to ad enhance the confidence level of adult learners in any particular skill that they decide to take and on, in, in these courses, as I say, it's self-paced. You can do it at 20 minutes at a time and then five minutes your work is saved. So we're really supporting that individual to, to at the end of the day, feel better about the skill that they go through, through examples. It's really much like talking to a friend who listens to you. It's interactive, you get to choose. Uh, whatever your choice might be. And at the end, you feel better about, be it collaboration, be it confidence. You just realize that, yeah, I've, I've, I've done most of this and now I know even more and there are tip sheets and, and, and it's a sense of achievement uh, without which it's, it's difficult as it is. But that lack of sense of achievement, I think, is, is a huge piece. And without that, it's difficult to go into the workplace where all these skills, good communication skills, uh, collaboration, uh, time management, all these are very key. So it really helps. Um, yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, it's, it's unfortunate to think there are certainly a lot of adults out there who do have hard skills and expertise in very particular areas, but maybe, you know, their literacy or digital skills are sort of holding them back right now in the workforce or, you know, diminishing their opportunities. So it's really great to hear that these resources are out there. And how can, you know, adults who are listening to this now, uh, how, how do they connect with, with this digital platform and where's the first mm -hmm. place they turn to? Yeah, it's abcliteracy.ca. Uh, so you know, even if you type in ABC, well, it's ABC Skills Hub with an ABC Life Literacy. So it's ABC Skills Hub in particular that you would like, you would want to go to. That is the online platform. And even if you just type in ABC Skills, then probably the Skills Hub will pop up. And that is where you can find all the courses that we offer. Um, and yeah, so the Activate Learning program has been pretty well known through the whole province by now. So I hope that maybe some of you who hear it have been 
partnering with us. <laughs> Absolutely. There's a good chance that uh, people who are listening right now have used this resource or maybe uh, intend to. And so this is all totally free of charge as well. People don't need to pay to take a, to enroll in this. No, no payment. No, it's absolutely everything is free of charge. And, um, and yeah, all you have to do is go to the ABC Skills Hub. See you. Awesome. And uh, one final question. So, you know, what what do you see as a next step? How, how do people know when they've, you know, uh, not graduated, but, you know, where do they go from here? And, you know, are there additional resources maybe for people who are somewhere in the middle here? Absolutely. So um, after each uh, learning module that uh, learners will complete, there is a certificate. Uh, so you can take all of the all, all of these learning modules available, um, but you can of course also um, go to uh, employment agencies that are in your neighborhood who might have these because you do have to also put all this knowledge into action. So, so we we are not able to help anyone find employment, but we do strive to give them the tools with which everyone becomes confident to find employment or to apply or to, to look for further help. So that is the next step for now. But we do have lots of lots of resources, like almost three, four a month that become available on the ABC Skills Hub. And Gwim, I want to thank you for taking your time today to tell us about the ABC Skills Hub. And certainly, if there's any other developments with this program, reach out, and we'd be glad to have you back on the program. And that was Gwim Phillip from ABC Life Literacy, who wanted to tell us about the ABC Skills Hub. And if this sounds like something you're interested in or could benefit your life, then research. Check out on the Google ABC Skills Hub. We're going to take a quick break, and we'll be right back. And that's a wrap on this episode of West Dock. I want to thank Premier Andrew Fury for being part of this show, as well as Gwim Phillip from ABC Life Literacy. And one more thing for you folks, before I see you next week, the Western Kings will be back this weekend, Friday and Saturday in Cornerbrook. You can check them out, get tickets. Hockey is back, and we will be broadcasting it live to you right here on Rogers TV. Until next week, thanks, and we'll see you soon. about this program, we'd love to hear it. Email or call us or send us your feedback through social media. Counting on you, Mr. Fraser. You can't live your life afraid of being who you are. Outlander. New season, Sunday, March 6th. Exclusively on W. When an impaired driver killed my brother DJ, my life changed forever. Life has changed for all of us during the pandemic, and many people are turning to alcohol and drugs to cope. Even though most of us are staying home more, 